This is Clean Radio. Welcome everybody out there listening to Clean Radio on our flagship station, 790 KABC, or on the World Wide Web at cleanradio.com or on XM165. We have an amazing show tonight. Give us a call at 800-222-5222. That's 800-222-5222. And uh, in the studio, joining us on the show tonight is my co-host, an amazing guy. He's uh, a master of social work. He's been in the industry for many upon many years. And with that, let's uh, welcome my co-host, Andrew. Andrew, welcome. Hey. Hey, Judah. How's it going? Good. How are you? Good. I'm in New Orleans. And I had a great weekend with my daughter and uh, watching a lot of people get drunk. It's kind of interesting. Well, that is New Orleans. <laughs> Um, but you know it's 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 pretty amazing because uh, we were talking today and you were sending uh, pictures of uh, you know your daughter and your cousin or your niece I believe right my niece correct. and yeah. they're both uh, they're both 15 years old or 14. 13, 14 years old and it just got me thinking it got me thinking a lot about uh, a a topic we're going to be talking about on tonight's show which is you know addiction with teenagers and young adults you know, the crazy behavior that's going on. And it was really, it was a nice picture you sent. You were really excited to be in the mall with your daughters. With your daughter yeah, and your niece, yeah. not your daughters. But It was it was a little less exciting to be uh, out in New Orleans with uh, 5,000 drunk people running around. It was, But it was a good time actually to sit with them and talk to them about it. So, uh, you know, especially the drinking here in Louisiana and um, and drug use. Cause yeah. there, was a couple of, there was a couple of people that were drug sick out in front of our hotel in the morning when we got up. Oh, wow. And uh, so I had to explain to them what that was, and that was kind of interesting to see their reaction. It was very wide-eyed, <laughs> thankfully. It, is that a hard thing? Because, I mean, yeah. I've been reading, and there are a lot of parents, Andrew, out there that are listening to the show. There are a lot of guardians, aunts, uncles. There's all these different types of people listening to the show right now. And I think one of the reasons I want to do the show tonight is because I want to offer a solution to people out there that are driving. You know, you have parents that are just scared to death. You know, they read these crazy stories. There's so many crazy stories. You know, we had this girl last week that c committed suicide. You know, she was raped, and then these crazy kids put up the, the, the pictures of it. You have cases like this that just happened in Cleveland. You have cases like this in Canada. You as a parent, I mean, are you terrified? Well, I think most parents um, have, you know, a good level of concern. There's also some, also some that are in denial because they're drinking or using themselves. And so they tend not to... Uh, they tend to minimize it or avoid the issue. Um, the other people that are sort of in denial are parents who think that, oh, my kid's too good for that, and they don't realize that this is a problem that can affect anyone. Um, and especially with the peer pressure that's just been getting worse and worse and worse over the years. I mean, it was bad when I was young. Um, it's only getting worse now. And there's so many different things now. There's like a new, uh, yeah. you know, drug of the week, uh, you know, that we, nobody's ever heard of. So... So, so um, we have all these designer drugs coming out constantly, and uh, the landscape's changing. The well, that's that's now. something you actually mentioned. That's it's pretty crazy. They, I'm going to bring up these numbers through the show. They, uh, you know, they interview teenagers over the past year over drug use, over what they've done, and what you're saying: 6.2 percent of of teenagers, of young adults, have used hallucin hallucinogenics in the last year. Right. That's actually gone down um, from the past, but. Remember that um, I think they've taken marijuana out of that, which can be classified partially as a hallucinogenic. That number, but, by the way, um, is 34 percent. Yeah, so that's that's really like LSD and you know mushrooms, uh, psilocybin, um, or mescaline, um, and those drugs have largely gone out of favor because of the ease of taking things like ecstasy, um, which have sometimes those drugs mixed in. So people, those numbers are actually underreported in a way because the types of drugs that are being used now by by adolescents are not the same that they were in the 60s or the 70s or the 80s or the 90s for that matter. Which is something we've spoken a lot about on the show is because we have so many permissive parents because they smoked pot in the 60s or 70s they they don't know you know they're almost allowing their kids to doing to do it not realizing that the pot these days like we've spoken about on the show is 40 percent more potent than it was in the 60s and the 70s. Yeah, I think it's I think it's an issue. I think that people don't realize. I mean, some do, um, you know. Uh, but there's been a, a real push to normalize marijuana use as marijuana has gotten stronger and become a much more complex drug. Um, you know, it's not easy to classify it. It's not. It used to be considered just hallucinogenic. We find out now that there's all these other uh, drugs within marijuana that um, 
affect people and that some have different effects. Some are actually amphetamine-like and stimulating and, uh, and so on. So it's a very, very different drug. Each type of strain of marijuana can affect people differently. And, um, you know, uh, the vast majority of admins that are seen in um, emergency wards for marijuana or for panic attacks and um, anxiety disorder related disorders. It can also bring on um, people that might already be predisposed to things like schizophrenia. It can accelerate um, the onset of such diseases. So if you're out there listening and you're just and you're driving around and you have any questions about this, if you or your family members in crisis, if you're concerned, if you have any single question, give us a call. The number is 800-222-5222. That's 800-222-5222 or 1-800-ABC-KABC. Um, we have a great guest tonight in the studio. We have a sex therapist. So we could sort of answer all types of questions tonight, whether it's regarding your sex. We have a specialist. We have Andrew with drugs and alcohol. And uh, she's a, a licensed sex therapist. Uh, she's a contributor to Men's Health, and um, she's got an amazing private practice. Let's welcome back to Clean Radio, Dr. Brandy Engler. Thanks for having me, and I'm also a clinical psychologist. And a clinical psychologist. Um, you, you're, the whole, you're the whole kit and caboodle. And um, so we've been talking a lot of stuff. You know, before we got on the show, we were talking about um, the way you treat uh, people with, you know, and one of the questions I had asked you was, and Andrew, I want to get your opinion on this too, is you treat a lot of people in your private practice that are sober and yes. have and, and, and have sex or sex, sexual issues. Yes. And is that is I mean, Andrew, are we finding that, you know, a lot? People with addiction and sexual for, for the guests, right? Yeah. I mean, I, I mean, so no, what I'm asking Brandy is so is is it linked, sexual addiction and alcoholism, or is it usually separate? Um, I actually see those as separate. Uh, typically, people who that I've treated, particularly when I was working in the rehab industry, are, are not having sex anymore. Uh, they're so far progressed that it's like the alcohol is overtaken even sex. But one thing I noticed is this phenomenon in the rehab where um, people are coming to me and saying, I've just met the love of my life. She's the one or he's the <laughs> one. Like, like I'm so in love, and you know, it's it's like sir, you just giggle. Like I actually have to contain that because it's they're saying it so often, and they really believe it. So that's actually really hard to work with, and um, you know, clearly that's that's a substitute for you know wh whatever they're trying to so whatever needs they're trying to get met. Um, but I think that that particular lesson for love addicts, for sex addicts, and actually for all of us in therapy, is having to realize that. There is no like idealized lover, some magic lover who's going to come and make our lives all perfect and okay. Right. And I think actually a lot of therapy is around realizing that truth and then grieving that loss. Like there is no knight in shining armor. There is no hero. There's no goddess, um, only imperfect human beings. And then the focus becomes how do you turn inward? Andrew? Well, that's depressing. Um. <laughs> <laughs> No, I, uh, I mean, I think, that the, I think that the point is good. I do think, though, that uh, you can have, I think what we're talking about is expectations. I think that um, people's understanding of what a healthy relationship is and understanding the valuability of each type, each human being. Um, obviously, nobody is completely perfect, nor are, are you the person yourself completely perfect. Um, and I think that everybody has to learn that lesson one way or the other. Otherwise, they become what we call narcissistic, where they just completely love themselves at the expense of everything and, ever, and everybody around them. Um, but that being said, uh, you know, we're dealing with, uh, if you're dealing with sex and love issues, you're dealing with powerful um, hormonal and chemical um, reactions in the brain. Um, that have very strong driving impulses, and that's very similar to all types of other addictions where you create some mm -hmm. sort of pleasure zone-related um, event that gets out of control and the person becomes highly dependent on it to cope with generally some other underlying problems. Right. Uh, I think that anxiety and depression seem to be the major ones you see a lot with sex and uh, addiction and, and love addiction. Um, and the feelings of loneliness, dealing with feelings of loneliness and the depression that can come from that. Doc, let me ask you a question. What is the average age you'd say of most of your clients? Oh, I'd say average age is thirty-five. Okay, so we're and and that's where they're at the they're almost at the end of their problem. 
that, that their problem is obviously a problem, so they're coming to see you. Yes. But the problem has been going on for years. So you have so many, and one of the things we were talking about at the beginning of the show is about teenagers, right? And how, I mean, to parents out there, could they use your, you know, could they, if, it, if somebody started seeing you at the age of 18, how much could it benefit them? I, I think it can benefit them. It's, it, it's uh, you know, it, I think the good thing about somebody who's younger is, you know, the disease isn't, isn't as progressed right. as it is in somebody who's 35 or 40 and really wants it. And it's just, it's so hard just physically and neurologically for them to do it. Um, whereas if you're 18, you know, your body's going to, you know, bounce back faster. But it's hard, it's hard socially. It's harder socially for them. And, and, I mean, also, I think sex and love addiction is, uh, you know, it includes things like um, chronic masturbation, um, unhealthy use of the Internet, and pornography. Yeah. Um, you know, these are the sort of the things. In it, and it really, for the average listener, I think they think that, um, you know, who could possibly have sex or love addiction? They don't understand the depth and severity of the types of uh, behavioral complexes that we have with people that have these kind of problems. And how much um, do you think, Andrew, the Internet has contributed to that? I think it's always been there. I mean, the largest fetish in the 1800s was something called braid cutting, and that was where people would run around, men would run around, and they'd cut off women's braids. And there's actually in the London Museum, they have um, a, a giant chest that's filled with um, over like two or 300 uh, women's braids. It was like some you know, fetish guy that would run around in this one guy's collection. So, you know, that's past, and I think the object, you know, we talk about object relations, especially with adolescents and healthy formation of object relations and understanding, you know, what's real and what's not real in, in relation to um, sexual interests and and uh, what it fixates on. Um, that's all part of this. So, you know, when, we, when we're talking about... Um, uh, what, you know, what is, who is a sex addict? Who is a love addict? And what is what is a sex a addict? Let, I mean, let's we're talking about a, what is a sex addict. I I think a, I think that it you know it, that's that line. It's like hard to define that line, but I think that when it's causing major destruction in somebody's life and it's you know they're unable to manage or control it. Um, I, I think that's a good indicator that the line has been crossed. Okay, so a, a couple of weeks ago, I had taken a few clients. This wasn't for me, I promise. I had taken a few clients to this thing called Sex and Love Addicts Anonymous. Okay. And I had gr told my girlfriend beforehand, so if anybody saw me at the meeting, they wouldn't, you know, say, hey, I saw your boyfriend at this meeting. Um, <laughs> not that there's anything wrong with it. But um, one of the things they had spoken about was fantasizing. They said that was one of the the, um, the the code words they use. Like they said, I'm a sex and love addict and a fantasizer, and um, it was very interesting. I had never heard that before. That they use fantasizing almost as an addiction. Oh, interesting. Yeah, it was. It yeah, was, I mean, a lot of this has to do with the compulsive nature of of trying to trigger that same stimulus reaction within your brain. Right. So. If, if uh, you know, fantasizing, use of pornography, um, stalking, believe it or not, is another one where people actually, you know, stalk people or become yeah. fixated on people. Right. Um, all the, and all these, I think, relate to, a comp uh, you know, a, a, a compulsive disorder, an underlying compulsive disorder where people are, they're just trying to hit something. They're trying to hit a drive within their brain to release these chemicals. Um, and the way they, get, they go around getting to that point can become very varied and very strange. So, you know, when we're talking about someone that really suffers from these, these types of disorders, um, you have to talk about severity. I mean, everybody fantasizes yeah. a little bit. Right. You know, everybody yeah. everybody wants to be in love, and people are genuinely in love, and in the healthy way, it's just a healthy way to be in love. Well, let's get to that um, in a second. Um, if you just tuned sure. in, you are listening to Clean Radio. That's Clean with a K. Give us a call at 800 222-5222. That's 800-222-5222. With any questions you have, I mean, these were tonight on Clean Radio, we're discussing a lot of very confusing topics. Um, you know, we're t talking about teenagers out there that are abusing drugs, young adults that are abusing drugs at an extremely high rate. And we're also talking about, uh, you know, sex addiction. And one of the things I want to like be able to focus on tonight is that there are parents out there that are really confused because I don't think parents know how to answer any of these questions that, 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 and one of the cool things about Andrew being sober, I being sober, you know, not, not just Andrew being sober, but you know, in the industry and you being in the industry is that we could actually answer these questions because I think parents Parents are scared to death to talk to these to their teens about this. Uh, yeah, you know, one of the things I see, especially with young adults, is that uh, a lot of their initial drug use that relates to peer pressure and wanting to fit in, 
and wanting to engage in relationships with each other, um, you know, romantic and sexually. Um, and when you really break down a lot of what uh, is a precursor to even regular addiction uh, to substances um, and alcohol, uh, we find that there's a lot of emotional relationship issues and family issues and uh, underlying issues that, that first precipitated that type of behavior. So, you know, by the time someone gets to sex and love addiction at 30, um, breaking down all those issues all the way back to the beginning of what might have been their initial addiction or initial drives that were pushing them into an addictive behavior. That's a complex complex task, and it takes a really skilled therapist to get that done. Who We have an amazing one in the studio tonight. And let me ask you a question to parents out there, because I think this is extreme. We know when sometimes that something's amiss, and, 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 and denial is an amazing thing. Andrew and I, we, we deal with this all the time, and I'm sure you do too. How how much better would people be if they were able to talk about this at a younger age? What, why why are the people that are coming into your practice with sexual addictions, with all sorts of addiction issues, why can't they have said it when they were 20, when the problem was there? Why don't they have the comfortability to do it? Is there a problem? I mean... I think that it's again, it's the social pressure. Right. I think that the social anxiety is so high, just the I, that the idea for them of of quitting is too intolerable, and so they'd rather just be in denial and and assume that they're just like everyone else. But I will say that I have I do get quite a few calls from young men in particular okay. who are in their early twenties, like nineteen, twenty, twenty one. Who are saying? Who are calling me and saying, "Okay, I think that I might have a problem with looking at internet pornography, but this is going hand in hand with feeling like that wasn't me, by the way." But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm good at doing those, just like yeah. without even thinking about it. Yeah. Um, without um, okay, so feeling like they're going to be rejected by women, or that they do get rejected by women, and so that they're leaning on the pornography to get their needs met. But the more they're using the internet, the sort of safe zone where they're anxiety for using the internet, the more an idea builds in their mind that women are very, pow- they hold all the power, like they decide if they want you or not, and they're gonna reject you for frivolous reasons, like if you're not big and buff, or you don't make a certain amount of money. And they start to build a narrative in their mind about women that's, that's pretty out of touch with reality, which further That's a funny word you're social- using reality because so many of our kids right are growing up with re- with this crazy vision of what reality is yes yes and so they have some, and some of them are talking to me have some insight into I, I think my reality like my sense of like what's true about young women I actually think it might be distorted and so they're trying to they're calling me you know for information about that right let's go to call let's go to DJ in uh, Los Angeles welcome to clean radio DJ hello how are you good how are you Thank you. Uh, interesting show. Um, I was an addict and uh, been sober 25 years, but it, it's a holistic sobriety. You have right to on. Do the whole deal, you know? Yeah. Uh, so I, as a young woman, was very hyper, hyper stimulated by sexuality and, you know, uh, partners and da 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 it was all part of the bigger thing. And the bigger thing was yeah, from no a pun intended, perspective, man. I definitely <laughs> believe that I was, you know, kind of born uh, to need stimulation, whether that was sexual or friendships or uh, you know, smoking pot or taking cocaine. And, or and you know, I think I think that's I think that's really true. But yeah. I also think that there's a warning in there, though. Um, there's a lot of clients I've seen that um, they are very repressed growing up, um, and they end up with addiction once they hit around uh, 19, 20, 21, and they get freed up from their parents and uh, a restrictive uh, home environment, um, and then a lot of those urges and stuff come up. Um, and become blown out of proportion again. So it's, yeah, it's I think we have to be careful. I think we really have to be careful with labeling. I think that mm-hmm. young people, you know, are just sometimes wired. Certain kids are wired for stimulation. Right, and, but DJ, you know, the ADHD point ADHD and all that stuff. DJ, the point yeah, that I, Andrew I, I was. Think that's true. I also think though that um, you know a lot of this is that we we don't take time to diagnose properly. We don't intervene early. Um, we don't really have good societal representations of healthy relationships anymore. Um, you know, uh, we're sort of in denial about what 
what a healthy relationship is. We think of right. still as the that nuclear family, and that, that doesn't really exist. Just statistically, the nuclear family is not the norm. Um, right. But nobody really talks about that because they're so scared to bring up the social issues and political issues related to that. But I also that. think you can come from very normal families. And all of this mm-hmm. stuff can come in because well, I was. Yeah, Absolutely. DJ, there's no Absolutely. rhyme or reason to why right, somebody. Exactly. But why don't you exactly. tell us a little bit about your t- sober 25 years? What yeah. have you done? You said obviously there are certain things you've done to become sober 25 years. And we love hearing people with 25 years co- sober calling the show. What have you done in the last 25 years to stay 25 years sober? I had to face it, you know, face all of it. Right. And I got into, you know, uh, AA, which I believe covered. The, the principles of AA can really help a lot. And being with people who understand where you're at. Right. But, but it's, it, you know, you have to face the crap. And that's the hardest part. Like, you have to face it all. You know, if you're sexually stimulated, face it. If you're chemically stimulated, face it and work it and become, you know, the person that somehow, somewhere way back you you know, you wanted to be. What do you think, you know, Doc? Go to work. Uh, right. DJ, can you hold on? What do you think? Uh, what that, do you th- that's right on. I love her line. Yeah. You have to face the crap. Yeah. I'm going to use that, DJ. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, well, that's cool. Yeah, I mean, and you know what's great about it? It's somebody that it's actually gone through it. And you're right. It, you have to, at some point, face the, you know, as, as you're saying, face enough the crap. Enough is enough. Right. Stand up. Go to meetings. Go to therapy. You know, uh don't use it as a crutch. Well, I'm this. Well, I'm that. I was all that stuff, but but I had to live. Right. And so to, in order to live, I had to be sober. I had to go to school. I had to you know hang out with people that were safe for me. I had the most amazing friends. They're all sober. Most amazing, and some of them aren't, but I am. You know. I am, because I know my stuff. And Andrew, this is always, sorry, DJ, but Andrew, this is always what we're trying to talk about on this show, and this is what you, you know, you stress on so much, is not just the, you know, it's all forms of sobriety, it's it's taking everything in, right? Yeah. Yeah, you know, I I think everyone's different, as much as alcoholics like to label themselves as having an alcoholic personality, um, when... When I think a lot of alcoholics may share a lot of traits, I think that still we're dealing with individual issues. Um, Everybody on Earth is different. Nobody looks exactly the same. Nobody acts exactly the same. Um, We're a very unique species in that, um, you know, uh, we're very, very um, individualistic, and and that's part of the problem. Yet we all share common uh, problems that we have to deal with and, and, and current issues that, um, our biology brings up for us as well as our social life. So it's important that uh, I think people examine their lives and their children's lives all the time and, and look for and offer healthy advice and, and make sure that people are uh, acting appropriately in, in a healthy way. And DJ, and, you know, thank you so much. Andrew, we got to go to break. Oh, but okay, uh, DJ, thank you so much for the call. If you just tuned in, you're listening to Clean Radio. We're going to come back after the break with Dr. Brandy Angler. Uh, an amazing therapist, also Andrew. And one of the things we're going to talk about when we get back is teen drug use and also uh, can you be an endorphin junkie? The discussion continues at cleanradio.com. Are you struggling with an addiction that's ruining your life? Want to have a confidential conversation with a professional that will immediately assist you? Do you suspect a loved one is abusing drugs and would like a free drug testing kit and consultation? Clean Treatment Center is standing by right now to help those with addictions and the people who care about them. Call 888-601-6040. That's 888-601-6040. Or go to Clean Treatment Center. That's clean with a K. CleanTreatmentCenter.com. Welcome back to Clean Radio. We have an amazing show tonight, uh, but also I want to say some great news that we've actually hit on Facebook. We're in the studio tonight with Dr. Brandy Engler. Uh, we have we hit 10,000 likes on our Facebook page, so we're actually really stoked and excited about that. So I want to thank all our fans out there and everybody out there that listens and contributes on Facebook. We're in the studio with Dr. Brandy Engler. She's a licensed therapist, licensed sexual therapist too clinical psychologist, psychologist. and um, you're also a contributor for Men's Health and an amazing blog you said it's called The Good Man The Good Men Project. The Good Men Project. And uh, we're also in this, we're also with uh, Andrew. Andrew, welcome back as always. Andrew, you're still there. Um, 
Andrew, sorry about that. Um, so we were talking about before the break, Andrew, we were talking about uh, teen, ad teen addiction. And there's some really crazy numbers, Andrew. In the last year, um, they did this with young adults and teens that 50% have tried alcohol, 20%, you know, marijuana. And the list goes on, you know, 3% tranquilizers. What do you think is going on, Andrew? Well, I think that this is nothing unusual. Um, uh, you know, teenagers have always used drugs, and um, you know, uh, if you go further, further back in history, people used to use alcohol constantly. I mean, it right. was in food, it was in you know, porridge contained two percent of alcohol in the Middle Ages, but people only lived to age forty. Um, I think, you know, I think one of the things is, is that uh, now there's just so much out there. There's so many different choices. There's so many more things that are available that parents aren't informed of. And that even young adults, you know, people that are in college, um, they don't know. You know, like Molly comes out and they just like, oh, here, take this. And right. They don't think anything of it. I remember you don't mean the girl and, Molly. You mean the drug, what they're calling. Right. Uh... It's, right. Yeah, it's, a, it's sort of like ecstasy. Right. It's supposed to be a pure form of ecstasy. The reality is that there's very little pure ecstasy left, which is MDMA, the chemical compound, because it's made from a tree in South America that someone extincts from the use of, uh, of, of the oil from the tree to make ecstasy. So now we have all these new compounds that are being formulated and put into what are considered ecstasy tablets, but mostly they're derivative forms of other drugs combined together to give a similar effect. Okay, so one of the um, things I want to talk about, though, quickly, because we, we are talking about young adults, and both of you are in the studio, Dr. Brandy and Andrew. One of the things I want to ask is, you were mentioning before about, you know, teenagers, young adults using drugs, stunting their growth, obviously, and the same thing could be said for sex, right? Um, well, not their growth, their, de their developmental growth. They're their so, mental, right, their yeah. mental, you know, so does the same yeah. thing work for sex? If a teenager starts having sex at 15 or 16, does that, that, does that affect them mentally? I think that the early sexual experiences sort of play a role in forming their overall like erotic template that sort of often carries forth through adulthood. Um, so I think it, I think it impacts, you know, their preferences and their fantasies. It's, it, it's weaved into their identity development. And Andrew, so do you in, the, in the in the 70s and the 80s, pornography, pornography really went to videotape, and it became very accessible to a large portion of the population. And uh, you know, the pornography industry is larger than the movie industry, so we know that mm -hmm. uh, there's massive viewing of pornography, and, and now the internet is just swamped with pornography. So access to seeing you know highly graphic, very um, objectified sexual images. Um, is readily available, and I think that's sort of unique in society now. It's you know, and and in the '70s, pornography got blamed for most sexual crime and sexual dysfunction. Um, now, like I said, I think it's always sort of been there. I think now there's the the ability for people to access these sort of things that tr can trigger a continued compulsive reaction, an unhealthy continued uh, compulsive reaction to uh, sex or, or sexual thoughts, or sexual fantasies, or sexual actions. Um, is more uh, is more readily available, so it's just out there more. And I, so, if you put alcohol on every street corner and you could sell it to everybody, and it was completely unregulated, you would see more um, alcoholism because more people would be exposed to a larger amount of the drug. And so, I think as we see unhealthy forms of sexual expression being expressed more and more, we're more likely to see people develop unhealthy relationships to that that type of imagery and or that type of relationship to sex and love. What do you think um, about that? Thought? He, I agree what he's saying. It's about the, the personal relationship to the imagery. And I also think because of the pervasiveness and the way it gets weaved into sort of social media, um, it's sort of interesting to watch this self objectification that happens the way that people use their own, you know, like devices like phones, to take pictures of themselves and put that up or to send that to people and how that becomes part of sexual communication but you know if you're talking about teenagers i mean this is a period of time of a lot of anxiety around both identity and like your social status and so i i think that you know the sexuality what their the sexual behavior is really is rooted back into that i mean i i also i have to ask this because you know, parents are so, I mean, what do parents do? I mean, and that's why I'm encouraging, you know, people that are have kids to call on the show tonight or teenagers or young adults, because what do you do? I mean, how do you even approach, you know, when I was growing up, the worst thing, you know, your parents could say to you is don't, you know, it was it, a, a porno magazine and booze was like almost the scariest thing for them. 
But today, there's so much. And well, there's I think the first thing is, you know, parents have to show a good example. You have to be a representative example of a healthy, a healthy situation, healthy relationship. Even that, you know, your life now involves divorce and separation, or, um, you know, um, if you're from a non-traditional type of family, um, you know, you still have to, you have to set the template, and uh, that's very important um, early on. Uh, and if, and if you are not setting that template, and you don't have that that type of representation, it's important for you to recognize it yourself and get yourself well so that you can set up that type of um, relationship for your children as well. And if you just tuned in, you are listening to Clean Radio. Give us a call with any questions you have at 800-222-5222. That's 800-ABC-KBC. We're talking about talking about a lot of stuff tonight, and I almost think it's one of the hardest things. You know, we, we constantly talk on the show, Doc, about um, when you're with Dr. Brandy Angler. Um, we, we constantly talk about the show is how hard it is. First of all, there's two shames. There's the shame that you're going through personally, uh, an addict of any kind. And then there's the shame that they have to come out of the closet almost and say that I have this problem. How, how do we make it easier? We're trying to make it easier. But, you know, especially with sex addiction, it's, it, how hard is it for people to actually make that first call to you? It's very hard. People are often super nervous, both on the phone call and in the first session when they come in. They're, they they feel the shame even as they're talking to me. Um, but I think it's really important that we work on the the stigma around uh, sexual addiction because of how pervasive it pervasive it is. Uh, like Andrew is saying, it's it's impacting. It, it's impact. The greater impact is on relationships and family and love. Um, something that's it's, it's important to the fabric of our society. So it is important that we address these issues. Um, so I think it's, you know, just the same way that you would address shame with any kind of addiction. But you don't think with, uh, you know, I had a friend years ago that, you know, had a sexual issue and um, I won't say what it was, but it was a pretty crazy sexual issue. He had gotten arrested for it. But one of the things he said to me was, you're very lucky that alcohol is your problem. He goes, because AA and or any 12 step group, you guys are accepted. He goes, I can't walk around the street and go, you know, I have this issue. And it really, I had a lot of, you know, I, I, but I know 50 years ago, alcoholics weren't looked at that, you know, it wasn't, look, you know, people weren't walking around going, I'm sober. And Andrew, today it's changed. How do we change well, that? With yeah, I mean, stigma, stigma has always been there. It's still is there for addicts. Right. I think that a lot of it's self-stigmatization, not only just um, with self -shame. people looking. Yes, the shame that exists within addiction. And that's why you see people that are addicts tend to isolate and they become more and more isolated. They don't go out. They stay at home. They just sit there drinking or using. Um, with sex addiction, we see people just sitting at home compulsively masturbating to pornography. Um, so, uh, you know, if people don't think that sex and love addiction is real. Um, you know, I, I was so very skeptical for a long time about that. Um, when, you know, when I've been doing this for 22 years, but in early in my career, I was very, very skeptical about it. But then as I saw very severe cases of people who basically couldn't function their whole life, and the whole day revolved around um, seeking that experience that they needed to feel normal at the expense of their job and their family, just like we see with alcoholism or drug addiction, where it becomes the driving thing that's the only thing they care about, the only thing they can do to function at all is to try and function within their addiction. Um, and those are the people that we're really trying to help. So listeners out there who have that same skepticism, oh, you know, I'm, I've been in love and it was reckless and crazy, but that, that one sort of experience is not someone that suffers from a chronic... Right. Well, that's what I want to ask you both. Yeah. What is... How do you how do you differentiate between... How do you know when phase is no longer phase and it's addiction? You know, because we have so many... I mean, the, the greatest form of denial is to say it's a phase. <laughs> you know, oh, it's just a phase what they're going through. How do how do we separate those two, Andrew? How do we know when, the, when phase uh, becomes... The biggest factor is when it starts affecting your life in unhealthy ways. So when the behavior or the use of substances is starting to have really ne strong negative impacts on your life that you can't control, where you're choosing that substance or that behavior over other things in your life that are, are more important or should be more important. And, and Doc, um, in your like, field, how do you... And also, it's unlikely to be bringing them pleasure. So, for example, right. a lot of people will say, well, what if the guy's just a womanizer? You're just giving them, you know, some excuse right. by using sex addiction to get away with, like, bad behavior, like being a womanizer. And I tell them, like, in general, like, someone who's a womanizer is enjoying what he's doing. He's getting a lot of ego gratification, he, you know, um, whereas the sex addict isn't 
gaining pleasure anymore. They're often not enjoying it. They feel desperate. They feel ashamed. Sort of like late stage addiction, late stage alcoholism. No longer are you enjoying it. You just have to do it because right. you need to do it. Right. And so well, you and, feel a compulsive drive to do it. Um, you know, need is a, need is a word that I think causes a lot of judgment. Right. Um, people you know, that are really suffering from addiction are actually driven by their subconscious to actually engage in this behavior over and over and over again, and they can't help themselves, or they have a feeling of helplessness. They can't help themselves, and it's regaining that control that allows people to either moderate their behavior or become you know, sober from or, or cleared of an addictive process or a compulsive disorder. Well, I think you both try to treat your clients the same way. We were talking before the show, Doc, about... Um, you know, one of the things when you treat people with sexual addiction, you try to treat the underlying issues. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. I, I just like to help people develop a more conscious sexuality. So I teach mindfulness. And so when that when that drive is experienced for people to turn inward and sort of, you know, take a look at what else is happening there. What are the emotions weaved in? What is the psychology that sort of weaved into that biological drive? So they can understand what it is they actually sort of want or need and, and, and how else, how sort of to get that met in a way that's constructive for them. Andrew? Yeah, I, you know, I think that's true. I think that in, 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 um, you know, it can be much more complex than that as well. Uh, you know, we deal with a lot of cases where we have poly addiction, so, and that it's also mixed with mental health issues. So um, I like to look not just uh, at the sort of uh, acute uh, uh, present uh, psychological factors, but also what's going on medically. Is there a medication that can possibly help along with, with, um, with the uh, therapeutic uh, intervention? And also uh, mindfulness is a part of DBT, which is dialectical behavioral therapy, and that's very much um, one avenue of therapeutic approach. There's also a psychoanalytic uh, approach, which is a whole other way of looking at things. So um, depending on the client and depending on how early on uh, the process might have been started and whether it seems to be just a physical addiction or if it does really seem to be deeply rooted in, in uh, psychological issues from childhood, um, you know, that might change my approach. It really depends on the client and, and what they're presenting with. Okay, and a question I have is, uh, do you take insurance? And the reason I ask is, is it's hard, it, does the government say sexual addiction? You could, tar you know, take insurance for that. Uh, generally, it's rare for me to see a client that just has sexual addiction. They'll also have some other underlying addiction as well. Um, we especially see that in the gay community where there's a lot of crystal meth use, um, but that's also becoming highly prevalent in the straight community as well. Um, so uh, most of the people that we see with those problems will come well, with what we call poly addiction. And we, of course, can accept insurance for people that have uh, um, uh, that type of illness. What about uh, for you, Doc, privately? I accept insurance, but there's not currently a diagnostic code for it for sex addiction and that's and that the new book just came out this year so that's how how many years every the, the what is it the ds uh, the, well, the, dsm the, 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 yeah dsm5 is, is coming out so uh but there's a lot of debate about that as well and you know these the dsm was created to give clinicians sort of a general guideline of how they could communicate about all the different psychiatric disorders that are out there um, and it's evolved greatly since its first couple editions, where it was really just sort of a written book. Um, and it then evolved into uh, a book that is now used generally to match up with what are called ICD-9 codes. So there's a DSM code, and then there's an ICD-9 code, and that allows for the billing of that particular type of uh, psychiatric illness. Well, the reason I'm bringing this up is because the people that are driving around, if they are considering having an issue, you know, if they are not considering having an issue, but if they do have this issue, one of the first things that people always want to know is, well, you know, will my insurance, you know, it will, can I get help for this? Will my insurance cover this? Is this out of pocket? Yeah. Usually yeah. there's there's some kind of co-occurring psychological, right. you, know, you know, some kind of anxiety or depression and that that, that gets covered. So typically it's, it's built yeah, that mean, way. You know, with us, we have people that specialize in this. So, that, you know, you can call our treatment center and we'll actually run your insurance and we'll look at what's called your EOB, which is explanation of benefits. And we can find out specifically what's covered and what isn't um, and let people know. And then we offer also a lot of free care um, to people that we can. Uh, we have sweating scales and our goal is to try to find treatment for people no matter what their circumstances are somewhere. Um, either location-wise or, um, or 
by means. Uh, there's plenty of help out there. People should not not deal with these issues because of money, right? Um, or because of they live in an isolated rural area. They, you know, this is a problems that can be addressed one way or the other. There's also a lot of good community support that people can use if they have real access to accessing uh, traditional means of treatment. There actually but, are um, some great groups, because when I did go to this SLAA meeting, the Sex and Love Addicts meeting, I was... Um, you know, I, I was sitting there and I actually had a lot of gratitude because a lot of the things they were talking about, this fantasizing, this, I realized it, those were phases. I, you know, everybody goes through phases and I had grown it. I realized it was very similar. Their sexual addiction was very similar to my alcohol is that, you know, for me, it wasn't a phase. I was an alcoholic. I couldn't stop drinking just like they couldn't outgrow their sexual what, what's the or right? they grow more compulsively into that behavior. And right. That's one of the things that I really, you know, I have some issues with self-help groups. I think that um, that some people have much more complex issues and that, you know, people that sponsor people in these groups aren't medically trained to handle uh, much more severe underlying disorders or even really progress alcoholism or drug addiction or sex and love addiction. Well, that, uh, the, that really, I think, requires a professional as well. But what I really do like about AA and SLA and these types of groups is they provide that good initial education about what a problem is so that people can identify with having a problem and they can get at least the initial steps down to where they can then access help long term through that community uh, a 12 step group where they can uh, form new friends and, and uh, learn uh, new behaviors but also uh, they can become more aware of their problem and then access higher levels of care so do you uh, so, uh, uh, without a doubt so doc do you how do you tell do you tell your patients to that they should go to 12 step groups cuz with especially with sexual addiction it's got to feel so isolating exactly like you were talking about earlier the shame it helps when they can you know um, have a community with people who understand that and who are like them and they can see that they're it's not that they're some you know deviant or pervert that you know you know, they can have a community that understands them. So I think it's it's actually very important. Do you do family therapy too? I do. I do. I do family therapy, couples therapy. I mean, because that's got to be the hardest thing is on the spouse or is on the, you know, I'm, I'm, it's like this amazing thing. They both feel isolation. Right. The spouses often need a lot of support. I'm actually amazed by a lot of the spouses, you know, that I see that really want to get educated. They want to be supportive. Uh, they want to play a role in, you know. And helping in any way they can, but they they definitely need a lot of support. How many phone calls do you get a day for pe from people asking for help about? Um, I'd say I get you know ten to fifteen calls per week. Okay, so out of that 10, for 50, 10 to fifteen calls a week, how many people actually show up? Um, maybe five or six of them show up. A lot of people will make appointments right. and then not show up, which worries me. And that's it's extremely yeah. scary. The reason yeah. I'm bringing that up is because, Andrew, obviously we go through the yeah. same thing. Something yeah. happens between that phone call and entering. And I think yeah, it's... Yeah, well, a therapist learn that uh, one of the hardest things to do, yet one of the most important things to do, is to first join with a client, which means create that initial relationship. Um, and when someone calls in on the phone, it's awfully hard to do that. Um, it, it takes a really skilled therapist, and most therapists don't answer their own phone at this point. It's, you know, you have to go through a process to get into treatment. So, you know, people that are out there and they get spooked or they get scared from an initial contact or a phone call that seems sort of cold, I'd encourage them to really take the time to go to that first meeting because with a therapist, because that's where they'll find out whether the relationship with the therapist is is comfortable or not, not over a phone call. Right. And if and if you have, you know. I mean, we call these conversion rates in the industry, right? You, you, the conversion from thinking about it to even calling, generally with an addiction, takes seven years before someone will pick up a phone from mm -hmm. the point that they start having a problem. And then from the point they pick up and pick up the phone and call for help, the odds of them then going into that treatment are about one in ten. So, you know, it's the, the amount of people that actually get to the point where they actually just even begin to get help is very small. Um, and unfortunately, what happens in the meantime until they finally do get help is that the addiction progresses and gets worse and worse, and the problem gets you know becomes much harder to treat. And I think um, you the, raise the a great point. And psychological damage gets worse. You raise a great point that addiction isn't going away. You know, if you have addiction, yeah. whether it's sexual addiction, food addiction, you know, alcoholism, drug addiction, it's not going away if you have it. 
no matter how much you wish and pray that it's going to go away. And we understand also that you're terrified. One of the things that happened, Brandy, at the last week's show is we got tons of calls after the show. And we, we get this a lot of times that call people that are scared, you know, that are very nervous about calling in. So we, I'm going to give out this number right away. It's 888-601-6040. That's 888-601-6040. That's if you have any questions. We understand that this is a terrifying subject for people to talk about. But please give that number a call. It's okay. We'll get on with you after we get off the after we get off the air. And um, but it's Andrew. If we could have helped one person tonight in saying, you know, you don't have to be terrified of getting this help. You know that. that well, even if you are terrified, yeah. um, I think it's important to face that fear. Yeah. Um, I think it, it is terrifying getting help, and any kind of change can be terrifying. But it's important to realize that there's people that understand that you're in fear and that you're in pain and that uh, there's help available and reaching out to those people that you feel that you might be able to trust with these very intimate and, 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 and often troubling uh, problems is the first step that, you know, asking for help and, and being willing to uh, lend yourself to getting help is, is extremely important. Um, and, you know, that's what we're here for. Yeah. And that's, uh, you know, good therapists are good at that. And, and, um, you know, admitting that you need help and getting help, it might be the hardest thing in your life, but it'll be the best thing you ever did if, uh, if you stick with it. Totally. Do you treat more men, doc, uh, do you treat more men or women? I treat more men. And, um, you know, do you think it's, I mean, is it harder for men or is it harder for women to get help with sexual addiction? I mean, we're talking, I keep on saying men, but there are obviously a lot of women out there that have this compulsion that have this addiction too. There are, um, you know, I don't know if, if I can say if it's harder for men or for women. I think that a lot of men are are seeing that I specialize in uh, working with men, and that's probably why I have a skewed practice. Um, but I do want to say that if anybody's listening and they have questions about sex addiction and they're looking for somebody local to talk to, that I am a therapist who answers the phone herself, and I offer free phone consultation. So I'm that's happy great. to talk to people and answer questions. And I mean, that's got to be so, I mean, that's got to be so difficult is, um, you know, for the people out there, I'm, you know, that are going through this, this, the shame with all these things and, you know, the self shame and, all, and everything, you know, just to get to your office, to get to that, the most important thing for people out there that are listening, whether it's for drugs, for alcohol, for, for sex is making, like Andrew was saying, that first step, you know, it's, it's getting from the phone call into therapy, just trying it one time, you know, it's like coming into treatment just one time. You know, or and trying even if, it. Even if your first experience of therapy doesn't go well, that doesn't mean you should give up. I mean, a lot of people try several times to get sober. They'll have yeah. many therapists, and sometimes it takes a lot of time. And uh, I think that's what's frustrating often for family members as well, uh, both parents and siblings and spouses, and uh, is that they see their loved one try to get help and fail, and then they assume that there's no hope. Hey, therapy is like hope. dating, by the way. That's how I look at it. It's a lot of first dates till you find the one you want to be with. Find the right match. Yeah, it should be like a one night stand until you find the one that you want to make it many night stands with. I know that's a bad uh, analogy <laughs> since we're talking about sex addiction, but it should be like it. And I think a lot of times people stay in bad relationships with therapists just like they stay in bad relationships in marriage because they're too Absolutely. lazy to get out. Who wants to have to answer the same questions? But well, it, it also starts the fear process again. Yeah, you know, it's, it, it, it's easier to be miserable and with somebody than, you know, happy and alone. Uh, uh, you, <laughs> least, it, there's a perception of that. That is know? so true, but it goes the same way with therapy. I mean, I mean, how many people stay with their psychiatrist because who wants to have to go through the whole process again of answering those same questions? It's like, it's like getting divorced and going on first dates again. Also, therapists have that position of power like other figures in society where yeah. people think that because they're the expert that um, they, they have a certain amount of, um, you know, power over them. I, you know, and that can happen. There are some bad therapists out there, unfortunately. Not you know, in like the Eric studio said. with us, obviously. We have an amazing, <laughs> we have an amazing therapist who's got an amazing blog on uh, the Good Men Project. The Good Men Project. And you know what's funny about that? And uh, explain exactly what that is. We're running out of time, but what is the Good Men Project? That is a blog uh, whose primary readership is men, and they talk about issues like recovery, sex, relationships, and sort of what it means to be a man. There's a lot of conversation on there about masculinity, a lot of conversation about aggression, violence. Um, they're talking a lot, actually, about what happened with uh, Steubenville and things like that. My only problem with the name of this website, I know you didn't start it, and Andrew will probably agree with me on this one, is that they call it the Good Men Project, and they put the word good in. And, um, 
you know, for me, I've had right. to take that word out of my vocabulary, right. good yeah. and bad. Yeah, I don't think it's a label. It's yeah. actually referring to a discussion that they're okay. having, which is what does that mean? Or how do we collectively redefine that? So it's a place where young men go to have conversations. I think that's great. And also you're contributing for men's health. Yes. And uh, which is pretty cool. I don't read men's health, as you could see, but uh, I might want to start reading it. Yes. And so some of script. Yeah, so. and, and I've got the book out, The Men on yeah, My Couch. The Men on My Couch. I actually was reading the book. It's it, it's an amazing book. I encourage everybody out there to get this book that you wrote called The Men on My Couch. Um, it's a great name for a book. Um, where can people find it? Uh, it's at all bookstores. and You can also get it uh, online at Barnes & Noble or Amazon. And it's doing really I well. Say, I have to say it was, a, it was a good title, but I had a few valets look at me funny with it sitting in my front seat. <laughs> yeah, it's actually very funny because I have it too. I had it in my car after the show. I had this, you know, it's funny. If I had the book The Men on My Couch or the book Book of Alcoholics Anonymous, I'm not sure which one they would look at me but uh, at the same time. But there are a lot of people out there that are just tuned in. You're listening to Clean Radio. We're a show about getting, getting the message out there of sobriety, the, the message of hope. And one of the things I want to say right now is I know a lot of people out there are scared to death of these topics, and that's okay, because before we've dealt with them, we've also been scared to death. So please give us a call, even if it's after the show. The number is 888-601-6040. It's 888-601-6040. The call is absolutely free. This process, Andrew, doesn't have to be that difficult, right? No, and I think that uh, you know, it's just all about reaching out. And uh, it's been a great show, and I, I can't wait to be back in the studio next week. Uh, once again, I'm sorry that I had to be out traveling. But, um, See, I didn't mention uh, it. I was trying to say that you were in studio. I was trying to deceive the people out there <laughs> well, listening. Well, the video feed didn't get that. Well, the people in the car <laughs> are, don't have the video well, feed. Get a paper cut out of me. You need to put it there. Okay, Andrew, have a safe flight. I will see you Tuesday night. All right. See you later. I'll t- I'll t- talk to you later. And doctor, um, I, w- I really want to thank you very much. You came in in the last minute, and uh, I-, I really love this thing that you do with sexual addiction because, you know, just like food addiction and other, you know, it's it, like my friend was saying to me a long time ago about, you know, I have alcoholism. You're lucky it's accepted. You're dealing with addictions that aren't so accepted yet by society. Right. And I, 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 I feel horrible for the people that are going through what they're going through that they just can't, you know, scream out loud, you know, I'm a sex addict and proud. Right. Because of the stigma. And you're doing something to change that. Right. And the people who are coming in are really, you know, your brother, the guy next door. You know, they're not they're not perverts or deviants. Right. They're just everyday people. And we got to take those words out of the vocabulary. And it was so many things, pervert, bad, you know. Right, right. And, and, and just change the, the words we use because words really are preventing people from getting help. And if you need any, I want to thank you again for coming in tonight. Anybody out there listening that just tuned in, if you're listening to Clean Radio. We had a great show tonight. You could catch the show on Wednesday uh, when we post it on cleanradio.com or on Facebook slash Clean Radio. 10,000 likes as of today. I want to thank Steve. I want to thank Mark. I want to thank Patrick. I want to thank Rand. I want to thank everybody that helps put the show together. I want to thank ABC for having us on. And uh, until next time, my recovery friends. Are you struggling with an addiction that's ruining your life? Want to have a confidential conversation with a professional that will immediately assist you? Do you suspect a loved one is abusing drugs and would like a free drug testing kit and consultation? Clean Treatment Center is standing by right now to help those with addictions and the people who care about them. Call 888-601-6040. That's 888-601-6040. Or go to Clean Treatment Center. That's clean with a K. CleanTreatmentCenter.com.